Case two, our two twins show up again at five months of age. This time they're, they're both febrile and have no obvious focus of infection. Uh, so these kids have had a fever for, th for approximately 30 hours, 39 degrees C. They're decreased breastfeeding, uh, about three quarters of normal, that's twin A. Twin B, uh, twin A's vital signs are there. So you can see that he's satting well. He's not excessively tachypneic. His heart rate's good, looks well hydrated. Uh, a little bit irritable when he's handled, but he's calm when left alone and there's no focal findings. Twin B, again, is febrile for 24 hours, 38.5, feeding has decreased, better than twin A, urine output has not changed. When you look at the physical findings, she has a few labial adhesions. Uh, other than that, there's uh, no focal findings of infection and she's well hydrated. So what are you guys thinking? What do you guys want to do with these? You, I don't know your name, so you get to go. Well, I mean, we have a full set of vitals on, for, on the, on the uh, child, I guess, uh, urine sample would be good. Um, and, uh, I, I'm not sure what else, I'm sorry. Okay, that's all right. Anybody else want to volunteer? Where are all our residents? Oh, there you are, Sean, hiding behind Brent, okay. I'd want to see uh, maybe a urine on this child. Anything else with blood culture? Uh, I think, you know, they're febrile, they're young. I think a blood culture would probably be appropriate. They've got, high, you know, both of them are 38.9, I think was the other one, and one was 38.6, sick for some time. Um, you know, finding a source of infection would be kind of the key thing. Fully immunized, you still want to do a blood culture? <coughs> I'd certainly consider it. Okay. Okay. Okay, so, you know, what now again? Do we want to do blood work? Do we want to get urine? Do we want to get a chest x-ray in these kids, given they had bronchiolitis in the past and they're well known to you? Do you want to do an LP? So of those, everybody agrees that we should do a urine. The other things, potential for blood work, would kind of depend on your threshold and how the child looks. And it's always difficult in a case scenario like this to, to really get a good feeling of the child looks really, really unwell or well. I would think the majority of the pediatric emerge docs in a five-month-old wouldn't get a blood culture, okay, in a fully immunized kid because, and we'll talk about why in one second. Okay, we did get urines on these kids, and uh, who would like to comment on those urines? Who's the young lady beside you? She's awfully quiet. Well, from Lauren, one of the R ones. Okay, Lauren, what do you think about that? So it looks like twin B has positive nitrates. Okay. So already think the infection is supposed to be increased loops there. Also looks more dry than twin A based on the um, SG there. Right. So. I mean, I would say definitely twin B likely has an infection. Sorry? I would say likely twin B has an infection. What about twin A with 70 loops? So less so with negative nitrates, but I mean, okay. that was the one that had the more serious vitals, so with the temp higher. So it would be hard to say it doesn't have an infection. Okay. So one of the things you need to know right away is how was this urine collected? Was this collected by bag or was this collected by catheterization? Because if both of these were collected by bag, you know, I might really ignore twin A right? But I wouldn't ignore twin B. I would, but if they were collected by cath, both of these would be positive in that case. And that's the important thing to remember. And that's one of the things that I want to talk about today. So there have been, uh, in the last year, uh, there has been a, a, a new position statement put out in pediatrics with regard to urinary tract infections in the kids from two to 24 months. And the reason I thought I'd talk about this is because it's probably one of the most common infections we're going to see now in the unimmunized era. They developed a flow chart, which I want you to memorize before you leave this room, and you have to fill out a, a memory quiz about what to do with these things. The vast majority of this doesn't affect us in the emergency department, right? So we're really interested in the front end part of this, box one and two. And what you really need to look at is that when you have a febrile infant, you have to make a decision. And what's really important, since the, the advent of the conjugated vaccines for Haemophilus influenza and for pneumococcus, we don't see the septic infant. The number one thing we used to think of whenever we saw a young infant under two years of age was they have, you know, sepsis or they have bacteremia that would lead to sepsis. So they all got blood cultures. They all potentially got put on antibiotics. Depending on their other symptomatology, they may in fact get an LP, right? And we would do a urine as part of it. It wasn't the main, main thrust of our, of our initiation. And, you know, I often say this, you're at great disadvantage because there wasn't a day that would go by in the emergency department in the early late 80s, early 90s that you would see a kid who didn't have meningitis. There's always one kid that would have meningitis. There's always one kid admitted to the ward with meningitis. You don't see that with the great degree of frequency as we did before, thanks to these vaccinations. 
As a result of that, UTI now is probably the most common bacterial infection in the age group from two to 24 months. So every, and, and for those residents who've worked in pediatric eMERGE, every time we talk about it, right, we say, what do you want to do? And you know, the, the quick thing that you learn really quick is a urine. And you look really smart and they pat you on the back and you, you, know, you get a little sucker for that. But it is important because we know that about 5% of kids in this group without a source, without otitis media or something else, will in fact have a urinary tract infection. And you know, urine is gold. So they made a bunch of statements with regard to this. Action statement one is this. If an infant is febrile without a source requiring an antibiotic to be administered due to ill appearance or toxic, the urine catheter or suprapubic aspiration must be done. So that's their suggestion from the, the pediatric guidelines. So you see a sick looking kid, you can't find a focus on them, you probably will get a blood cutcher on the sick looking kid, the really sick looking kid, but you need to get a clean urine. I've asked a lot of five months olds to stand up and give me a midstream. To date it has not worked well for me, maybe some of you have. Every now and again the nurses will clean them off and they'll start peeing and they sort of catch in the cut, but by and large that doesn't work. How many people here have ever done a suprapubic of the attendings? Yeah, I know you have great, Chris, what? Well, there's a good study for us to do, right? Un ultrasound guided suprapubic aspiration versus catheterization for some young resident who wants to look at it. James gave you something there, okay? Um, anyways, statement two, febrile infant with a source who does not need immediate antibiotic therapy, you should assess for likelihood of UTI. There are several studies out there that suggest in point of fact that about 10 to 15% of kids with an upper respiratory tract infection may have an associated UTI. So if you don't think about it in those young kids, you just say, oh, it's just the cold and send them off. But you gotta remember, there's some criteria that go with this. Then in point of fact, you may be doing them a disservice, okay? Um, you know, if, if a high likelihood, in other words, you think, you know, this kid's had five UTIs in the past, they're febrile, haven't got a focus, high likelihood, go rate the calf. If, and we cath all kids under three months as a general starting point right away, okay, because it's just easier. If it's a low likelihood, you can start with a, a urinary tract, uh, a, a UVA bag. Uh, if it's positive, do a cath. And there's a study done by McGilvery published a few years back in about 2001, 2002, that showed that if you use a UA bag as a screening technique, you're, you have a pretty good probability of picking up the kid with a UTI. You do get some false positives, but that's okay. You can also have some false negatives with cath. I've seen some of those that come off. Anybody we cath automatically goes for cultures, regardless of the urinalysis, right? Because you've done an interventional invasive procedure, you probably should do that. Okay, girls, especially young girls, are 2.27 times more likely than boys to have a UTI. Uncircumcised boys are four to 20 times more likely than circumcised males. So you see that little five-month-old sitting there, he's got foreskin over, his, uh, his penis, he's got a much higher chance than the kid who comes in with a pristine, nicely sculptured penis, okay? <laughs> <laughs> girls, <laughs> girls, girls who have labial fusions have a higher risk, right? Because again, they have difficulty forcing out their stream. So who are at risk? These are the two categories by this paper. Now remember, this paper is a lip biased because it is American data, so this may not pertain to Canadian patients as well, but in their study they found the following. Girls who are Caucasian, age under 12 months, had a temperature of greater than 39 disease or fever greater, for greater than 48 hours and no other source of infection were a prime candidate for UTIs. Where in the males, they were non-black, so that could be Hispanic, Caucasian, Oriental, okay, everybody but non-black race, temperature over 39 degrees, fever for greater than 24, so a shorter duration of fever, and absence of other risk factors, you have to consider UTI in. But since urines are so easy to get by a bag, if nothing else, then, you know, I bag a lot of these kids regardless, or our nurses actually bag a lot of these kids when they walk through the door, so you have the urine by the time you get to see them, okay? Because they don't pee on demand. So what they really said in action statement three is that you need require both a UTI requires both a positive urinalysis, so some leukocytes or nitrates or leukocytes and nitrates, plus a positive catheter uh, culture. Um, I've seen kids who have, I mean, that's their statement and I, uh, I'm not disagreeing with it, but I've seen kids who've had negative urine cath, cath done, so their, their urinalysis is absolutely negative, but they've had, you know, five uh, times 10 to the uh, greater than 100,000 plaque forming units and hence have a UTI. Um, so remember that what makes a urine analysis positive as well as a culture positive is how long the urine sits in the bladder prior to the kid peeing. 
and that if you have greater than 100,000, the traditional thinking is you have a definition of a UTI. The new guidelines looking at all the literature from multiple studies and meta-analysis suggest that it may be as low as 50,000 coliform units. This is going to be problematic because if the lab doesn't have greater than 100,000, they may not do sensitivities on it. They may report it as mixed bacteria or a single speech less than, and then they give you that little blurb, you know, clinical symptoms, blah, 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 okay? It is important to note that a single organism uh, and uh, and one that's recognized to be a uropathogen is most likely to be a UTI. Having said that, in complex kids who have altered problems, so they may be cathed multiple times because they have neurogenic bladders and stuff, may have multi-organisms, okay? So if you're growing something like Enterococcus and Klebsiella, Enterococcus and E. coli, that's probably a UTI and you gotta treat appropriately with both organisms. Uh, the route of administration, this is a, a, a long one, you know, do you give oral or IV? and they've been demonstrated to be equally efficacious. So who do you really put an IV in? I think that's a kid who's vomiting, who looks sick. That kid's gonna get an IV. The other kids can go home on, on parental or oral antibiotics. Um, and, and also, your choice of antibiotic depends on local susceptibility. So we used to use Septra almost exclusively here. What's happened over time is we now see E. coli that's resistant to Septra in kids much more frequently. So Cefixime has become the drug of choice. Single dose, once a day, um, eight milligrams per kilogram per day, and it's, a, it's an excellent drug, well tolerated, kids like it, compliance is good because it's once a day. So how long are we gonna treat these kids for? Well, seven to 14 days. There were multiple studies done in the 70s, 80s, and 90s looking at whether one to three day therapy, similar to what we can do in some of our adult population, uh, was to be used, and what we found that was inferior, you either didn't clear the UTI or you had a high return rate of symptoms within 48 to 72 hours. So the suggestion is a minimum of seven days. Okay. All right. Action statement five. Uh, who needs uh, renal ultrasound? Now, again, you know, we used to ask this question of the Royal College residents, what they would do afterwards. There were two things. They used to always put them on antibiotics until they got seen by their doc for a long term and they got the renal ultrasound. What the new recommendations are is everybody should have a renal bladder ultrasound to look for anatomical abnormalities um, and to evaluate whether they got two kidneys and the usual thing. That does not necessarily have to happen immediately can happen several weeks after the diagnosis of UTI, so that's something you can recommend that they get done by their family doctor. We used to also say that all kids needed avoiding cystic urethrogram after their first UTI. That has now fallen under disfavor, although there are some rebuttal arguments from the urological society saying, oh, no, no, we should be doing this on everybody. And it really indicates if your ultrasound findings are positive, then you need to go on to a VCUG after the first UTI. If they're negative, then you wait to a second UTI to do a VCUG. Prophylactic antibiotics, remember we used to take these kids, they'd be on long-term antibiotics, is no longer recommended because it does not risk, reduce the risk of uh, reflux nephropathy, where they get the dilation, you know, so they're grade three or greater, they'd all be on antibiotics. They no longer are doing that or recommending that. So you don't need to discharge them on a long course of antibiotics, just treat them for seven days and have them followed up with their family physician. Uh, Gary, for the ultrasound, um, to what age range is that? This is up to 24 months. Up to 24 months. This is the guidelines for 24 months. Some people do it up to five years, but, but clearly in the first two years, okay? Greg? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good point, because, I mean, it's not unusual for us to see kids coming in with <coughs> multiple history, history of multiple febrile illnesses treated in the community as a query otitis media, and they come in and, and to us and look at the ears, and it might have been a little bit red, but basically it's not an otitis media. It ends up being UTI, because we work them up for it. And so the question becomes, this four-year-old, you know, who's had multiple antibiotic courses for otitis media, have they really actually had UTIs? And so those kids, I usually, you know, tell them to get some imaging done. And I think I would agree with that. I think, you know, the great difficulty is we love the diagnosis of otitis media, right? I mean, because even when we can't see the ears, a number of residents who may later on to go be attending physicians who see wax in the ear think the kid has an otitis, right, because it's red. Uh, uh, is problematic. I think you have to use, I mean, this is the guidelines. Remember, you have to use a little bit of common sense. If you've got a kid who's had a recurrent history of fevers, has never been worked up for a UTI, you find he's got a positive UTI, you've got to be thinking in the back of your mind, could this kid have had multiple UTIs that were missed and self-cleared? Uh, so point of fact, I will do the same thing. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so, um, and their final recommendation is that once a UTI has been confirmed, parents should be instructed to seek medical care within 48 hours of future febrile episodes for exactly what Greg's talking about, right? Once you've done it, there is a potential susceptibility or increased risk of susceptibility 
associated with these kids getting recurrent UTIs. And recurrent UTIs may be problematic. There have been a couple of studies to demonstrate that even with a single UTI, you get DMSO changes in your kidney and they resolve, but, which suggests an early scarring, but they do resolve in single, but multiple UTIs, you do get scarring, and hence your kid who ends up needing <coughs> dialysis in their teens because they've had uh, recurrent urinary tract infections that have gone undiagnosed and treated. Okay, moving along to our sorry last. To sorry to interrupt, uh, sorry, you know your first time. The, uh, so if I have a catheterized urine, like it's spotless on the dipstick, uh, uh, I, know, I know you read about that, so you mentioned it's, it could still be a UTI. Are you starting them? No. So if I get a kid who's got an absolutely clean cath urine or suprapubic aspiration, whatever, uh, for those of us who still do them or can do them, then what we do is we send that kid home. We, if the culture comes back positive, we call them. Or, or then we give them the proviso, you know, the kid's getting worse, well, any usual things that you would do. Yes, cath urines, they will do a culture on. Bag urines, they'll do a culture on it. Mean, if you send anything to the lab, they'll do a culture on it. But I do not send bag urines because, you know, depending how long the bag's been on, and the Gilvery study it showed very clearly the longer the bag is on, the more likely you get t typical flora associated with that part of the anatomy. And many of those are urinary tract causing agents, right? So you may get a single growth of something in, in sufficient quantity. So if, if you did do a bag sample, it comes back, then I think you're behooved to have the kid come back, do a cath urine on them prior to starting antibiotics to ensure that you've got a UTI. Yeah. Um, Gary, Gary, has anybody looked at the uh, cost of cath in terms of what's the risk of introducing UTI? I just worry about that in, in kids who, you know, we're instrumenting their bladder and we can cause a UTI in somebody who doesn't have one. There, there's always that inherent risk. I don't know of any study, and I can't remember McGilvery's study, whether or not he actually talked about uh, kids, any of those kids getting infected as a result of their intervention. So, you know, I, I, I agree. There's always a chance, like when you do an LP, right? I mean, there's always a chance that you sneeze on the needle just before you put it in and you give the, the person, you know, uh, your own meningococcus. Uh, I think, you know, it's, it's always a balance of risk versus benefit. I think the, the downside is if you get kids and you're not doing a cath urine and you start treating them for UTIs, it was probably a little worse when they used to have VCUGs as a first recognition. You were probably doing a lot of instrumentation to this child who really didn't need it because they didn't have a UTI. The other corollary is that if we miss a UTI because we didn't get a reasonable sample, right? If we get a bag and it's negative, you say, oh, it's a bag, I'm going to throw it away. But in fact, it was, a, in fact, a positive UTI. So in the young kids, I have no hesitation, Kathy. We, there are other complications associated with catheterization. We have had occasionally a catheter not on itself, which is not pleasant because it's not really nice to pull a knotted catheter through somebody's urethra. It's just a theory. Uh, and, uh, but that tends to be really low. I've yet to see in my practice realizing it's absolutely useless e evidence. Anybody who's come back following a catheterization with a UTI, Greg? You know the kids? No, I can't. Chris, anybody? I don't think I've ever seen anybody, okay? And, in, you, know, you know, and it's very interesting. I mean, we just came back from ISIS, or ISIM in, in Dublin, and there was a UK speaker there, and they just, they, there's no such thing as a bag in Europe. They just do not bag people. They either get a suprapubic or they get a cath. And even they're kind of against cath. They want super pubic. Greg? Well, Mil McGillivray in the 80s used to do caths. Uh, the nurses used to do them in triage. Yeah. So a febrile kid came in, they got a cath urine, period. 